This is Paul Ryan from Origin, and you're watching Richard Metal Fan. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Richard Metal Fan Interviews, episode number 159. And today's guest, we're talking to Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan is the founding member of the band Origin, death metal band from Kansas that's been around since the late 90s. And he also has another band called Mantra, which we'll also talk about. Today we're going to be talking to him about what got him into metal and pretty much going through his albums that he played on. So without further ado, let's go talk to Paul. So what's up, guys? I am here with Paul Ryan from the Almighty Origin and Mantra. So how are you doing today, man? Great. I'm just uh, at work working on guitars and stuff. Another day, another dollar. Awesome. So you basically like build guitars and stuff? No, just repairs, basic repairs and stuff. I'm not a luthier by no means. Awesome. So you just like fix guitars that they, people's guitars that they like break or something? Yeah. It's like pickups or output jack or setups or, you know, volume pots out, you know, whatever, stuff like that. Not actually crafting the guitar. Awesome. So kind of like the format of of this podcast is I want to do like a rundown of your discography and talk about like your musical journey as an artist. So before we go into okay. that, take me back to young Paul Ryan. So kind of growing up, what were the first bands that got you into metal and what made you want to be a vocalist and guitarist? Uh, well, it's kind of weird journey to get to the guitar but uh my mom was a drummer and she sang and played piano and uh so I was always around music growing up my dad was more like the outdoorsman the sportsman you know the disciplinarian you know what I mean so the, those two things intertwine later but uh uh so I want to say when I was probably around five uh, you know, I started having a real interest in playing the drums, you know, like getting behind the kit and trying to tinker with it. My mom would teach me like rudiments on the snare and, you know, uh, you know, she was like, no son of mine is going to have square wheels. You know what I mean? So yeah, <laughs> I, I was gonna, I had to have good timing, you know? And uh, so um, that that's kind of where, uh, I started on drums and and uh, um, my favorite band growing up was definitely Kiss. I was actually Gene Simmons, I think, when I was six uh, <laughs> for Halloween. Even though I was a drummer, I was more enamored by Gene Simmons and the blood spitting and all that from the 70s and stuff. Um, but uh, my uh, uh, my plan to become a drummer got thwarted a little bit um drums band started in fifth grade and orchestra started in fourth grade and i was uh uh mrs rowan she came in and uh she played uh star wars on the viola or something and i was like oh my god that's it drums are stupid drums are for girls i want to play <laughs> viola i want to be john williams uh, you know, I want to be James Horner. I want to make compositions and stuff like that. So I was in fourth grade. So my mom was like, okay, you sure? And I was like, absolutely. Don't want to play stupid drums. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, because, you know, when you're at that age, you know, you're kind of impressionable. And, you know, the only real drummer I knew was my mom. You know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, anyway. So the kit went in the closet or whatever, and uh, I started playing viola and uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. And I was pretty good. I, I can't deny. Uh, I, I practiced at it. But I think, you know, like, I was kind of in the lull of, like, you know, music and everything. It wasn't a kiss. I took off their makeup, and I wasn't interested as much in them anymore or whatever. So anyway, uh, uh, let's see, like, uh, I started hearing stuff like Motley Crue and Rat, Dawkins and Ozzy and Twisted Sister. And I was like, oh, man, I want to rock, you know, <laughs> it's like yeah. some quiet riot, you know, stuff like that. And I was like, oh, so I was like, viola's stupid, viola's for girls. <laughs> <laughs> 
because uh, the girls the, the the people that were better than me at Viola were girls so I don't know <laughs> I don't know why I'm being so hated like or, or I was such like that but anyway uh so I uh uh so mowed lawns or whatever and I and saved up my money for a guitar and and you know I got the guitar and then they're like oh well you need an amp and, and you know all this stuff so my dad since I worked hard on mowing lawns and all that bought spent you know whatever this is like 83 or something I don't even know you know threw down three hundred dollars on an amp and a pedal and strings and a tuner and why I bought the guitar you know what I mean so that was cool he, he's like you put the work in I'll match what you put in so anyway I was uh determined to get good at guitar I really wanted to, I thought you know MTV was booming and you know you saw videos and I was like that's it this is what I want to do that's all I want to do in my life I just want to do like that and uh so uh you know at this time you know I was figuring out how to play songs and, and the good thing was was because like I said I came you know, my mom sang and played piano and, and I had good timing. And like I learned by ear, I could kind of take, learn a lot of things from the viola helped me be able to play the guitar, even though it's tuned differently. It made me understand fingering and, you know, like, you know, I could sit there and determine that this note went here or whatever. And there's a fret on a viola. So the guitar was actually kind of easier. And, uh, you know, I started getting in the Slayer and uh, my first guitar didn't have a whammy bar, you know what I mean? Like, like what, you know, like a Floyd Rose or a Kaler or whatever. And then uh, and I also heard Yngwie about the same time. So I could actually kind of figure out how to play the Yngwie stuff thanks to my, you know, three years of playing viola or whatever. So anyway, uh, uh, let's make a quick story, a funny story. Um, I was obsessed with it, you know, like I wanted to be the best guitar player. And so like I uh, took a you remember old ghetto blasters, you know, with the tape player or whatever. Yeah, sort of like the boom big boom boxes that Yeah, are. so so I have one of those and like if you push down two buttons and have blank tape, you record yourself, right? So so what I did was record myself playing viola. Whatever for like 30 minutes, right? So my mom would be like, okay, time to put down the guitar. I'm going to start cooking dinner. Uh, you need to play your practice of viola for 30 minutes. And I was like, good. Wow. <laughs> this is stupid. I don't want to play stupid viola. I want to rock like with the sister. <laughs> you know? So anyway, I pushed play on the tape and uh, I set it in the corner uh, the tape player net where my practice area of the viola was and I would quietly take my guitar and and it had a headphone jack and I would go into my closet and just play guitar for that 30 minutes or whatever <laughs> so so therefore uh I'm gonna say a week or two I got away with it you know what I mean uh, but I made one mistake one fatal flaw my mom was be listening and be like hmm he's making that same mistake you know, and as a, a parent, and obviously music inspired, she was, was rooting for me to get the note right. You know what I mean? So anyway, she figured out there's something funny. He makes the same mistake, the exact same point, exact same time every day. So anyway, she creeped in and she picked the little lock, you know, put a toothpick in the door. And, and I, the closet door opened up and thank goodness I was playing guitar and not looking at playboys. Cause I was, you know, <laughs> you best at boy. <laughs> but she's like, Oh, William, Brian, you're supposed to be practicing. Viola. You're all stupid. I want to play guitar. So anyway, yeah, luckily I just got caught sneaking, playing my guitar and not looking at playboys. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which could have been the case, uh, could have been the case. At some point there, but I didn't yeah. get caught on that. Yeah, and that's a good but, thing uh, to know. So anyway, at that point, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so, you know, like throughout high school, you know, like uh, I, I think I played my first show uh, for the junior high and that was just covers or whatever. And then, you know, like 
I had a Slayer patch and I, I was totally in a Slayer and the music just kept getting heavier and heavier and heavier. Like, you know, Slayer, Celtic Frost, Possessed, Voivod Creator. And then, you know, I, I, there was, I'm originally a Kansas boy and, um, you know, like, I, uh, there was, there was a good amount of metalheads, but there was also these punk guys that they turned me on to like DRI and suicidal tendencies and, uh, Oh, Cryptic Slaughter and oh, who else? Um, as Stormtroopers of Death, you know, like, so, so, like, I got influenced by these, the other side as well. And, like, you know, like, I started to really, really stray away from, you know, the earlier, like, glam metal, you know, like, I still, res I still respect the guitar playing of, like, George Lynch and uh, Warren D. Martini and all, you know, all the Aussie guys, so I can rule, but, you know, what I mean, like, I was going into the heavier, you know, start hearing Napalm Death and, uh, you know, then I heard Obituary and, you know, I heard Carcass and Deicide and, you know, Suffocation. And I was like, what? Brutal Truth, you know, that was what I was into. And so I had a, some failed attempts at bands and, and, uh, oh man, I was like, almost, almost uh, gave up on it entirely. And, uh, and I said, you know, like, I said, all right, this is it. And I got one last shot and I formed Origin and then I got everything aligned, I guess, per se. Yeah, because I know, you know, Origin formed in 97, 7. So yeah. how'd you get to know everybody in the band at that time? Um, well, the lineup was different, but uh, so I, uh, so, uh, I played in this band called Necrotomy, and I played in this band called The Abomination, and then I played in this other band, but it didn't work out. And it was like the precursor of Origin. I'm like, so originally, I the drummer, his name was George Fluke. Um, I almost played in his band that was already formed called The Excessive Strain, but it just fell apart right as I was kind of being introduced to being possibly a member. Uh, but Anyway, so I always jammed with George. He was a really excellent musician and taught me how to think about music differently and all that. And then um, Clinton, I'd actually met um, through uh, probably like in 91 or 92. I just kept hearing this name about this guy that could really play guitar, even though he played bass on the first Origin uh, lineup. Um I, I he came later so mark had jammed in uh the end of necrotomy and also played in the abomination and that's the vocalist and then uh jeremy was just a guy that i'd seen around town uh, at the shows or you know at the outhouse or like these different metal shows around our area and uh basically i ran into him at a let's see who was it down by anger propane pissing razors and wait that's not the order it was down by anger pissing razor pissing razors spud monsters and propane show it was like july 4th weekend somewhere around july 4th we can't figure it out if it was the fourth or the second or something but it was like a july 4th weekend kind of thing and and uh i don't know i was i saw him and i you know mm -hmm. it was like a hardcore show but it was something to do you know what i mean so it was like so uh he was wearing like a death metal shirt and i was like you you still listen to death metal and i think i was wearing a tomb shirt or something he was wearing a DSI shirt and he's like yeah you know like i, I get down with you know nothing else to do is go to hardcore shows like yeah fuck it and uh we started throwing some names around about bands we like and and i was like well fuck i'm off tomorrow hopefully this isn't a children's program but I'll, I'll back off on the i cussed a little bit back then I'm, I'm not so much a cusser now but i'll be over tomorrow let's jam so we got in the room together and started jamming and we uh uh just played covers you know and i showed them some of my older band stuff that i you know i don't really know that many covers but i knew my own songs and i like this is some of the stuff i did with some tapes you know garage We tried out one guy on drums and he tried really hard, but he was like, 
man, can't you guys just do some Slayer beats? You know, he's like, you guys are blast beats all the time. Uh, you know, it's blast beats at double bass. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, anyway, one day we showed up to the jam hall and the drum set was gone. I was like, sorry, guys, going to have to find a different drummer. So, I mean, he was cool about it. He put in the effort. But anyway, so I kind of had the drummer George in my pocket and I didn't want to mess with him because he had got a serious job. But I ran into him and he's like, yo, man, you ever want to jam, let me know. And. I said, well, I got something brewing, and he told me to come over, and I want to say this was, like, January of 98, and, like, Clinton had just moved back to town. I told Mark about it, and, uh, I mean, we basically wrote four songs, opened up for Suffocation in, in May, and uh, recorded the a Coming Into Existence EP, and then... Um, uh -huh. Love that. Um, yeah. And then, uh, so, yeah, like, and then we play like with Disassociate, maybe Wormwood and Phobia. And then we played open for, uh, oh, uh, let's see, it was Cryptopsy Nile, Oppressor Gorguts. And then, uh, and then, uh, came, George was pretty, you know, he had a state job. He worked for a state. So it was like, he was, you know, it's like after that, you know, to that job, you know, I mean, a pension and, you know, you can't really tour or whatever. And like, I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm all in. You know what I mean? Even though we had a rarely, fairly good amount of success unsigned. And then like, but so Clinton, um, he wanted to get back to playing guitar and I was like, okay. And so, um, looked around and we found Doug Williams who played with Sepulchre Carnage and then John Longstrap. He lived about, they both lived about an hour or so away from me and Jeremy and um, Mark. So anyway, so I think uh, that was 98. So 99, I think our, we opened up for Napalm Death with the new lineup. And um, then like we started just playing Colorado, New Mexico, Arkansas, Missouri. We did like Texas. We did the November member in Texas, and uh, we uh, we played at the March Metal Meltdown in Jersey. I want to say this is ninety nine. Yeah, it was ninety nine, and yeah. we were just playing all over. And um, Relapse came to one of our shows and checked us out, and they were calling. You know, that was on a Saturday in Denver. That's where relapse was formed. It was actually Colorado before they moved to Philadelphia. But um, so that Monday they were calling us talking about record deal. So uh, I don't know how extensive you want me to get, but that's yeah. everything up to prior the release of the self title, which was like 23 years ago, yeah. two days ago, I think. Yeah, it was actually a day, day ago had its 23rd anniversary. Sorry, which I yeah. think is, it's my opinion, one of the most underrated death metal debut albums of all time, the self-titled. Oh, well, I thank you. Huh? Yeah, thank you I, very much. But I, but I know this year does mark 25 years of the uh, coming uh, to into existence EP, P, which, yeah. is, P, which is uh, the, your first release. So how do you feel about that, like, first EP, like, now 25 years later? Oh, I mean, I'm really, I'm still proud of it and what it did. You know, like, first of all, I finally had something that was tangible instead of a ghetto blaster fucking recording, you know what I mean? Like, or a garage recording or something, you know what I mean? Like, a, when I had an album cover and lyrics, you know, even though it was a tape at first, and that was a cassette, or a cassette, and then it was a CD. Um, For, you know, relative small amount of time writing four songs and coming up with what I feel at the time was completely original compared to anything else. I mean, I always try to do something different. Uh, you know, uh, you know, that in the late nineties, early two thousand, everything was bottom heavy and bouncy and no solos. And so I was trying to do, you know, like something that was still very staccato, you know what I mean? but yeah, very drum oriented and very rhythmic percussive and attacking yeah. and had the grind atmosphere to it. So, um, you know, I was trying to, I, and you know, then 
you know, George uh, did all kinds of crazy intricate drumming and then, and, you know, the one handed roll on the pattern blast and all this stuff. And, and, uh, and then when he left, you know, it was a lot different than John played, which was, which was, he was very uh, great at the standards of death metal with the blast beats and the double bass, but, you know, it was a little different for him. And then by the second album, though, I really feel like it became his baby per se, because they've been playing it for three years at that point, instead of like, oh, I've been in this band for just about a year and we're already in the studio. You know what I mean? Like, and it hasn't, it wasn't fully his style yet. Some of the songs he was copying, not copying, but he was his take on the original style of drumming. Whereas in Formus, it was his drumming and his style. You know what I mean? It was like his yeah. his thing, you know. He'd been the band now at that point for some time. So Yeah, but but tell me about about like the going back to like the fir first album because I think it's a great debut. I feel like like you like all those songs all those songs are pretty like short. Most of them are short to the point, like under like three minutes, but minutes, but expect for, for like so suicide, I think is the longest, like four minutes. So I just like how even like some of the couple of the early versions, like right, man, manimal existent instincts and inner reflection it's definitely like the new the versions that's on the origin i feel like are a lot more refined than what was on a coming into existence well i mean yeah i mean uh, coming into existence was just recorded and uh we just recorded each song twice and we just chose the best take and uh and we recorded those uh the drums live and then uh yeah it was it was all live except for the vocals you know what i mean we recorded in a room that was all mic'd up so it's a lot different vibe instead of like tracking each part, you know what I mean? Like, oh, the guitars are going to be done after, you know what I mean? This is just scratch guitars that he's playing to. Um, so there was, you know, a lot more production value into the self-title. Now the self-title, um, I mean, we, you know, we went, as soon as it came out, we were on tour for like seven weeks. I want to say, I don't know, maybe more than that. I can't remember. But, uh, you know, so Freelapse at that time was pretty experimental as an album. You know, they had bands like uh, Mortician and Exhumed and 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 Nile. And, but they also had bands like Dillinger Escape Plan, Stay as the Day and, oh, I don't even know, you know, Nas. But, you know, like, it was a pretty wide spectrum. So people didn't know what to expect, like, when they saw the first album cover, it's like, what is this? Is this stoner rock or what is this prog rock? You know what I mean? Like, what is this going to be? So like in the early days, people were like, I, you know, I had no idea when I pushed play what it was going to be, you know what I mean? So it was, yeah. and so we had a pretty wide fan base because I mean, we played with Dillinger, you know, Escape Plan. I mean, Mastodon opened up for us. I mean, High on Fire opened up for us. I mean, you know, those bands obviously grew more successful, but, you know, we were playing with, I remember we co-headlined with Thursday at some college Earth Day. <laughs> you know, wow. Like, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I can't remember. I mean, we, you know, we toured with Yob and Orange Goblin. I mean, or that's a little later, but we still, we still toured with or played shows with all these various bands, you know, I mean, Isis and, and Converge and uh, Be Numb and Deceased and uh, Stay Is The Day, you know what I mean? So like we were all, you know, we're playing with all these different bands, you know what I mean? And just getting our name out there, it was like, you know, our name was just always on a flyer somewhere, you know, <laughs> on some tour. So yeah. I think that helped with a lot of growing the band, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then going into your second album, Informus, Infinitus, Inhumanus, because usually with the debut album, you have like your entire life to write it. And there's a lot of hype with the first album. When it came to making Informus, did you feel like pressure to follow up the self-titled? Oh, well, yeah. Well, I thought at that point we had played so many shows together, more than like a coming into existence to the lineup that was on the self-titled, you know, we had toured and played so many shows together, you know, like a couple hundred shows between, 
easily a couple hundred shows between the first album and the second album. So, you know what I mean? It was like, uh, and we're talking in two years here and we were writing and all that stuff. The gap was really quick, but um, we were all determined to, you know, um, put the former members behind us and try to write a different sounding album, even though it was origin, but, you know, like, and like I said, John was coming into his own as his own drummer for Origin. And, uh, you know, Doug had commitments elsewhere. So we got a new bass player, Mike Flores, and a different vocalist. Because Mark was not boring. He was in a training UFC fighting and, and stuff like that. So anyway, we kind of had a little chip on our shoulder against ourselves, against the, you know, we felt like we were overlooked a little bit, you know, in the grand scheme of the death metal world, I guess. So he wanted to come out with something super vicious for the second album. Yeah. And hard to believe that, you know, last year was of course the 20 year anniversary of, of it. So how do you feel about, about it now? Like 20 years late later, because I know there was like, there's still like a couple anniversaries I still want to touch upon, but that's like the, the next one I yeah. want to talk about. No, it was, uh, so, uh, I was, you know, like, I mean, we got some press accolades, you know, I remember Hit Parader said the heaviest heavy metal band from America ever in origin, you know, on the self-titled, but, uh, you know, like, I don't know, mp3.com, we were number one on Grind, we were number one in Death Metal when uh, Informus came out, the album came out, we went on, probably, well, I felt it was the biggest tour of the summer that I saw anyway, it was, um, Origin Hate Eternal uh, Nile headline, but it was Arch Enemy's first tour with uh, uh, Angelo. Angela. Andrew, Angela. And I mean, no, we didn't know that. I don't think anybody knew that it was going to be. I mean, we knew the shows were going to be big, but I mean, they were. I don't, where are you located at? With what? Where are you located at? I'm in, I'm actually located in in Georgia, like north of Atlanta. Okay, and have you always been there? Yeah, I've pretty much lived there, lived here oh. since I was like a kid. Okay, yeah. so I don't know if you remember the old masquerade. Oh yeah, I used to go there a lot. I even I've yeah. even I've been to the I go to the new one too. I pretty much go to like every metal show that happens at the masquerade to the point yeah. where like the staff knows me. Yeah, so so the old the old masquerade, the big room heaven it was i mean just for example that room was full you know what i mean like the big room for yeah. you know what we played there on summer slaughter tours and not had as many people as there was i think for that arch enemy when played you know what i mean but uh so anyway that was like a great tour we just toured straight for like i don't know six months you know what i mean pretty much was maybe a week off to get connect get home connect to another tour you know um but uh yeah i mean like we were getting a lot of, you know, we did, you know, tour, 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 and, and a lot of great press and all that stuff. And the band was going in the right direction. We just had uh, booking problems and that caused internal problems. And then we had some member change, but that's the way it goes, I guess. So, but uh, I guess that, that would, that would lead us to echoes of decimation, if, if, yeah. you know, yeah, you know, which will if get... that's where you want to go, or if you have more questions. Well, I got. Well, I had no because I know around the same time time as in in uh, Informus in two thousand two, you were briefly in Murder Construct with uh, Travis Ryan from Cattle Decap. I'm always curious because I don't think nobody ever really knows about that. Well, here's the thing about Murder Construct. And Travis came later. It was just me and Leon Del Marte, or I'll just call him Leon Del Marte and not say his real name, but I don't know. Um, so um it was me on bass and Liam wrote the guitar song songs and then we would practice sometimes he would play drums sometimes he would play guitar and to a drum machine and uh, none of those songs i mean <laughs> i still have like the blank cd and it just says with sharpie 13 tracks of shit and i always wish he <laughs> <laughs> He never recorded or released those songs, and I mean, uh, I, I, they're they're 
I thought they were good. I, I wonder if we could ever do something with that. I mean, like I'd have to relearn it because uh, playing it wise, but um, yeah, the what murder card construct became. I was never in a room with anyone else but Leon, and that was in two thousand two. 2000 yeah i want to say 2001 i met leon in 2001 and then we start after touring with uh on the first summer summer slaughter uh uh when he was an impaled and then we became friends and then that's when it all came open so and then and then the whole thing with the lineup change in origin i find a uh um drummer for origin so yeah, then then kind of going into the next origin album, Echoes of Decimation. Shouldn't I like like that album? So what was that like going from Informus to Echoes? Well, um, after uh, so we did that big tour with Hate Eternal and all them, and then um, we had a party in the ways with Jeremy, um, and so Clinton uh, came in and filled in on guitar. Uh, for the Informus era stuff, and uh, and me and Clinton um, were more more similar, I guess. At, at the time, I thought playing wise, than me and Jeremy, so uh, kind of had more of a similar playing style, I guess, which led to like what we call riff arts, which is all over the the Echoes album, which is like our arpeggio used as a riff in the song and so that was one thing that was certainly different and then we also had a different drummer in james king who was only been playing drums at like four years at that point i think he was 21 and uh he was a guitar player that turned the drums and he was just very very solid like his double bass and blast beats and his you know were you know his stamina and everything maybe wasn't the most inventive drummer because i think he's you know still thinks He's a, he's a guitar player that transfers drums where John or George were true drummers, you know what I mean? So they think a little bit differently than a guitar player who plays drums. So uh, Echoes came out and we started, like I said, we do, we did some weird touring, like we, you know, it was Yob opening, Origin, Orange Goblin. We did a tour of Malevolent Creation and Animosity. Um, we did a tour with Uphill Battle. I mean, we were still touring a lot and uh you know getting you know like things were different there was you know it wasn't like we were getting we had a good booking agent which is one of the problems we had um uh, that led to the leaving of some members and the, the informants line up and uh you know like we were kind of getting pinched on like how much we were getting paid and we were getting constantly screwed over. And so relapse kind of took upon themselves to form relapse booking and rich hope who was the drummer brutal truth was our booking agent. Really it was perfect for us because we were just, we felt like so, uh, uh, anti agency, anti all this stuff, you know, corporate structure stuff where, you know, they only care about the headliner and the openers get screwed and all that stuff. And like we kept getting pinched all the time on money on the road and, you know, like just fake deals or whatever. And it's like, so we had this in house booking with Relapse and like the band was touring, was pretty positive and growing in the right manner. Um, but again, Clinton, who brought in James King, who was in Unmerciful, they wanted to focus on Unmerciful now you know so so i had to start over again and uh and uh so uh we contacted john very mutually you know we hadn't talked that much and i you know we told him that things have been well things are growing things are different you know and you know maybe we can make this work again and so that's where we formed uh uh, started forming the antithesis album, but, but, which I think is 
think is good, but still talking about like echoes because I just think it's like your guys' most technical album today. It's just only 26 minutes, but I especially love like the song Debased in Humanity, which like towards the end, like the vocals take a break. And I really think the guitars really shine on that track. Uh, yeah, that was one me and Clinton wrote. It's pretty funny because he forgot half of it. I, I wrote half and he wrote the other half. And then like we went out partying and then like I was like, man, what did you write yesterday? And he, and he was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to sit there and do our foggy hangover and try to piece back together that song it was pretty funny because we were we figured it out kind of i think i don't know it's exactly what we originally wrote but it's close yeah but um so yeah uh i mean echoes was like you know uh it was it was just a very death metal album with like uh, you know everyone was you know, like I said, the self-title on Coming in Existence was very staccato and very rhythmic and no guitar solos. And then, you know, and Formos was very, like, death grind and crazy changes and bombastic where, uh, you know, was, Echoes is like a very serious, dark death metal with a lot of, like, technical uh, fast arpeggios and stuff. Yeah, but then going into Antithesis... I think it's a great album. I think it's I've kind of like a little as so shows like more progressive kind of side of you guys, especially like the title track, which is probably the longest song on on there, which is like nine nine and a half minutes, which I I just think is great. Even like other songs like Finit and Algorithm, like everything, I think it shows like some like progressive uh, side of you guys. So, what was the thought process going into this album? Well. Um... Everything that you know, like that was probably like our my song flashiest. Well, I don't know. I I wanted to more. Okay, so the first three albums are very much an action movie. You know what I mean? Like just all action, not a lot of plot. Just throw the grenade, boom, boom, boom. Explosion, Directed explosion. by Michael Bay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, it's just it was to the point, very direct, and lots of lots of kill. Lots of kill and blow up stuff, you know what I mean? So, uh, as far as like not the lyrics, but I'm talking about the you know, like just the attack of the album, where as with antithesis, I went with Moore's, uh, like, uh, like a kind of like a movie or something like a compositional dyna dynamics is what I call it. Uh, or like I was trying to make like these different. You know, it's you know you're gonna get a you're gonna go on a roller coaster. It's gonna be fast. It's gonna do some curves and twists and turns. And you know, the, each album I try to do something a little different. So it's like it's not exactly the same. And I know people are like, well, I like this album or I like this album or you know, you know, because of this or that. And it's like, well, I'm just glad that people like our albums. You know, sometimes they don't like the next album or whatever, but. You know, it's funny, and I go, you know, I came back and listened to that a couple of years back, and I was like, man, how stupid. I like albums. I like that album a lot more than I did when it came out, because you get used to a certain style. And I just wanted to keep it interesting, you know. I, I just wanted to give myself uh, and the fans, the listeners, something different, but it's still origin. So yeah, and how and you know, and this year does mark 15 years of antithesis. So kind of a question I'm always curious is is there a chance we can get maybe a celebration of this somehow? Maybe have you ever thought about like doing something where you play this album start to finish? Uh I just think that self short your the rest of your discography. I'm not I'm not really a fan of that. And and besides, uh there's guys that aren't in the band anymore uh that are on that album. I mean the only thing that you know. Uh, you know, so well, I'll, I'll mention it when we come to the album that we did do a full album playthrough, but that will be later. So, <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, every tour we do, we always play like a song from every album. Um, but since it has been some time and 15 years since uh, James has been in the band and Jeremy helped write some of the songs on that album too with Mike and himself. So it's been, uh, you know, like to me, I mean, the, you know, we always play, you know, you know, at least one or two songs from that album on tours. So to me, it, it the, you know, like, you know, the, 
There's a reason why there's a past and there's a reason why there's a present and a reason why there's a future. You know what I mean? So like uh, I myself, I, I, I am as much as I love certain albums by certain bands, I like the surprise of not knowing what they're going to play. You know what I mean? Uh, I, you know, like um, Death All, they, they played something from every album. You know what I mean? And it was pretty cool this time. And that's huge. Steve DiGiorgio like telling the story in between um, yeah. the songs and everything. So, I mean, to me, that was cool how they went from different albums and different eras. And I, I mean, I just, you know, like I can understand when an album comes out, they play something start to finish, you know, I'm like, um, but uh, at this part of my career, I don't see it anyway, like something like that happening. All right. Um, uh, at least from the old, old lineup. All right, fair enough. Anyway, the next album, Entity. I like this album. It's a pretty different album. Album. So, what was the, what was this album about? Um. Well, that one. Uh. That we were a three piece. Um. James was no longer in the band. We had a fill in guy, and he decided that he was not committed enough to do the vocals or commit to writing the lyrics. You know. So basically, I had the songs kind of written and <laughs> boy it was we needed to get in the studio and record and we just got a new deal and everything and we tried to give the illusion that we were the same band without actually showing that that we were a three piece that's why there's three pillars on the back you know like with some faces kind of merged into them it's not very easy to see we tried to be a little mysterious about it oh, wow. um, because we didn't want people to know that James, you know, wasn't in the band. I tried to mimic his voice some. I didn't do perfect, but yeah. I tried. And then Mike joined in on vocals. And we basically wrote the lyrics. I mean, so the thing was with that, I was going through a lot of different personal struggles and relationship struggles and band struggles or whatever. But, uh, I mean, the best thing is I can put it in the music. Um, but, uh, um we were all worried about the vocals. And then, uh, so uh, we had all the parts done, the music and everything. You sound fucking and, sick on this album, by the way. I thank you. Was... And Mike, Mike did some vocals on there too. I mean, so we both sound badass. Yeah. So we went in, uh, went in and I was like, okay, guys, I'm going to try this. This is, uh, I think it was Evolution of Extinction was the first song that I tracked vocally. And uh and that's Mike's lyrics with me doing and my I I was just like he kind of just showed me like dot 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 you know like follow the dots, you know what I mean? And I was like, okay, I think I got it. And I was like, guys, just let me go in the recording room and uh do this song and and then uh, when I come out, I'm going to let you guys come in and I'm going to stay in the other room and uh, you guys listen to it and then uh, tell me if we need to find a vocalist. And then they came out five minutes later and I'm like, no, nope, we don't need a vocalist. Just keep doing what you're doing. And then Mike went in and did his parts, his overlaying vocals just on the parts and then we just so Mike would be doing vocals and I'm sitting there writing lyrics and then I'd be doing vocals and Mike would be writing lyrics. I mean, we were just like, yeah. oh, oh man, I, I felt like I was a I, I was never a college kid, but I felt like you know what I felt like I was definitely uh, my brain activity was definitely being pressed a lot in a different way than it usually had was. <laughs> so. Yeah, and then. Uh, Go ahead, honey. Yeah, I yeah, I was just you were just saying something I was like you to say. And then uh so you know, people were like, I'm sitting there, I'm practicing to the album after we had recorded it. I'm like, man, this is hard. There's so many vocals. It was written as it would to be a fourth member in the band. Uh John kept saying, I know this guy, I know this guy. He's in Africa right now. And he's in school for anthropology. And I was like, well, I don't know how that's going to really work. You know, he's in Africa. But 
the album comes out and, they, and we're going on tour and they're like book of the stores and we don't have a vocalist that and we've got john's like oh, I'm, I'm telling you i think he's the guy for the job and then he's like well i was like well who is this guy and he's like well it's the it's uh it's jason kaiser the the guy who came in after sherwood for skinless and i was like oh yeah i remember seeing him on his first u.s tour and i was like and I was like, boy, he's going to have his hands full. And I was like, hey, he did a good job. And he did his own thing that was still felt like skinless, but it was his own thing. So I was like, this guy already knows how to come into some big shoes to fill. And like, you know, John told me, he's like, you know, he, and I was like, well, let's just do it. You know what I mean? And I was like, he came in and he said the hardest part of Vinley's Skin, skinless song would be the easiest part of any origin song. He's like, man, this is a lot of words. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, he came in and he brought in his own charisma and kind of like the whole. He's as much as he is a a great lyricist and and vocalist. He's also like a showman. Like he's got a showmanship too. He's yeah. brought a different. James was a very big, scary guy. Less is more, you know, uh, kind of mentality on stage, you know, a couple words and and then the song starts. But, you know, Jason has this like this charisma and, and like he makes it, you know, uh, you know, you know, I look down, we're playing some super massive heavy riffs, you know what I mean? And I see a bunch of people smiling and having a good time, you know what I mean? So he makes it a fun show and he changed the dynamics of the band and a lot of, excuse me, stage diving and stuff like that. So, I mean, just like the wall of death and, you know, all the original ideas with the, the wheel, spin the wheel, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, we did so many, you know, we've done, uh, you know, well, you know, we've done a chicken fire wall of death. We did, we did black metal versus death metal walls of death. We did uh, young versus old, new school versus old school walls of death. You know, we did, you know, we did all kinds <laughs> of different things. You know, That's pillow awesome. fights. You know, you know all this kind of different stuff. You know, you know. So we've had like little, you know, chicken fire where it was like the little guy on the bottom with the big guy on top with the big guy on the bottom with the girl on top in the chicken fight. So <laughs> <laughs> wow, man. <laughs> So yeah, you know, we did tsunami wall of death, chicken fire wall of death. I mean, we just had so many different things. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like just different things, uh, you know, like whatever, spin the wheel and, and you know, like pick a song or what you know, you just did different things. So it's a very entertainment value of things. Yeah. And uh so I mean that changed the whole dynamic of like our live atmosphere and you know, we were on a different label then with Nuclear Blast and, you know, like just a lot of growing. I thought, you know, led us to the next chapter. Omnipresent. Which and, is the uh, album that actually got me into you guys, how I discovered you guys. So that one was Jason's first uh, album with us vocally, although he had been with us for, you know, since the very first show of Sorry, I'm in my repair room. The dust is getting to me. Um, the very first uh, Entity show. Well, I'm going to break for a sip of water here. All right. Me too. Okay. Uh, so, you know, at this point, we've been traveling all over. I think we we did, you know, Europe a bunch of times. We did Asia, Australia, New Zealand before. And then, like, uh, uh or we come in uh, omnipresent and start doing all the you know exotic places and uh, um, omnipresent was like we were a little worried or I was a little and Jason was a little nervous too about coming in and so like I did the wrote the vocals and the lyrics for all things dead and then he finished pretty much I mean I may have added a part or two throughout the album but I was going for a more compositional dynamics, more diversity, a wider spectrum. I mean, you still knew you were getting origin, but if you want to have an album that's instead of 27 minutes or 30 minutes, and you want to have 40 minute albums, it, I felt like if we just did action movie the whole time, Michael Bay, shoot him up, you know, like 
you would get your 30 minute album, but the album still has 30, you know, the newer albums still have that 30 minutes of intensity that the old albums did. That's just, I just do different segues and like, you know, I did like a guitar solo in there or like a guitar interlude anyway, you know, there's different things that make the um, album different, you know? So, um, I mean, it's a very, we also went to like the throwback we started doing grindcore songs, and you know, I don't even know if you have the bonus track. We yeah, did "Kill uh, Yourself," though, which Kill is yourself. the SODD cover. What made you guys yeah. decide to cover that song in particular? Um. Well, uh, so at that point, let's see. We did "Flattening of Emotions" once, and then, uh, yeah, at that point, it's well. That one of the things was is like uh. Uh, I don't know exactly why we were so on it, but our our uh engineer Robert Rebeck, he's he's my agent. He 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 grew up with the '80s stuff or whatever, but he kind of he knew a little bit about death metal or whatever. But you know, he was he, he liked SOD, and anyway, I think we were just jamming around and talking about it, and then somebody came up with a bonus track idea, and I was like. Huh. So I just learned uh, my tune differently, and I just learned it by ear playing it in my format of playing. So, like, it was something that was quick. And I mean, the vocals are really challenging on that. So, I thought Jason did a killer version, literally, <laughs> of the uh, vocals on that. So I mean, I heard SOD was looking for a vocalist, and I said, hey, man, I think you should cement yourself in. Even though you sound different than Billy Milano, you kind of killed it on that song. So more than kind of. So it was just something fun and just sporadic, and, and you know, we didn't have to think about it too much. So it was, you know, like, it was just a fun, heavy song to play. Yeah, especially like love, like, the little instrumentals, like Permanence and... Uh... The continuum and even like absolence, which I think is just a perfect like little breaks in between between that to give the listener some breathing room. Yeah, no, I I mean that was intentional. Like some people said we should have just included that as one track, and I liked it because you could just put it on loop, you know, like hit repeat and just listen to the interlude over and over. That's me. Continuum was like the one thing that was I probably wrote that was the oldest thing on the album I probably wrote that around 86 at least the first part of it because I was very heavily influenced by Van Halen and uh, and just the hand structuring of it the first part even though it's in different it's the same shape that Eddie uses on Hot for Teacher it's yeah. just in different places of the neck and played a little differently but I that's where I, the whole thing came from and then James Horner you know, the Star Trek guy, and, you know, it's John Williams, the Star Wars guy, and James Horner, the Star Trek guy. They all have various careers in music. Those guys are like two of the greatest musical writers I think there are, is James Horner and John Williams, you know. So, like, just look at any most sci fi, and James Horner and John Williams, they had a big, you know, now they got this new guy, I can't think of his name, but he wrote Time, and I can't think of his name right now. But anyway, uh, now 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 he's like his own workshop but those guys were like the masters to me of writing and i was just trying to create interludes that took you somewhere else uh on the album that maybe people weren't expecting from the past efforts yeah and then then your last album unparalleled universe i like this album so what was that like going from this to this well it was the first time that we had the same lineup on two albums consecutively. So it was like actually nice. Uh, I thought like we worked well together as a band and we also played the album in its entirety. Yeah. Live. <laughs> so yeah. anyone from that era on can say, hey, we play, you know, uh, you know, we're doing the one day. I mean, it started as like, we're doing the one day anniversary of the release of uh, <laughs> Unparalleled Universe. Whole album start to finish. You saw it first here. You know? yeah. <laughs> it was kind of a it, our gimmick at what everyone was going like, well, 10 years ago. So, I mean, that was our anti retro album thing. And it was like, <laughs> so, 
yeah. so yeah we played we played the whole album in its entirety and then we played a track from all the other songs at the end you know what i mean and yeah. called it a day <laughs> I wish I could have seen that because I, I think the only time I saw you guys was I think it was might have been one of the first tours on this where you did the Summer Slaughter that year with uh, Black Dahlia Murder and Dying Fetus, and I think that was a great show, great show. Yeah, that was a great show. I but yeah, we didn't get we didn't only we had to play a shorter set than whatever that time length of forty five minutes. So we, yeah, we so we played we played more of like a kill mode kind of uh, maybe a song or two off that and. You know, rather than like the whole album so yeah and then and then i know no also last year sure before we get into the latest origin album i know you did a little side project called mantra and you did the coup down the rising so what was the origin to no pun intended to make 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 a side project um well i always had a desire to play uh music um uh, whether it be drums or bass or guitar and like uh, I actually um, met Rudy in 2006, I want to say, and uh, and we just became friends, and I liked his guitar playing and stuff, and I'd always paid attention. He was in a band called Psionic with um, uh, Jeff Huell, who, you know, I don't know if you know who that is, but he's a pretty big name as a bass player. He plays in Six Feet Under. He played in Bile. No, he played in Brain Drill. Anyway, I I can't even tell you how many bands that he's been in. But uh, so he he um, uh, and then they had a a drummer from Black Fucking Cancer, and uh, the singer was from Death Grave. Now now, but anyway, I went and saw Rudy play, and then the drummer who he played in a band called Ion, and currently in Cartilage and Ghoul. And he's currently on tour with Exum filling in. Um, we're just always, you know, I met him when he was a young kid, just coming up to me and asking me about death metal all the time. And uh, so they, 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 Rudy had a song and they got together and jammed. And I, I you know, and I was like, oh, this is really good. I really like it. And they're like, yeah, we're looking for a bass player and a vocalist. And so, Anyway, they kept going at it, and like uh, this was before COVID. You know what I mean? So it was like perfectly bad timing, <laughs> excellent but bad timing. It was like we started a, uh, you know, mantra, and like uh, I basically said, "Yeah, well, that guy said I might know a guy who does basic vocals. That's me." <laughs> so anyway. And it's tuned all different, and uh, and uh, you know it's kind of different. I might help. I don't write hardly anything. It's more like I might do some arrangement with composition, and um, you know, like. But we get together. Rudy has a song probably to a, already done, and then we get in the room and kind of just hammer it out to make it so it's the three of us. And it's fun because it's, um, like I said, it's completely different tuning than Origin, and Origin's different tuning than standard tuning, so it's like, this is completely different. It's like, uh, like it's E, A sharp, E, regular A sharp, where Origin is B, F sharp, B, E, G sharp, C sharp, you know what I mean? So it's completely different. I'm playing a four-string bass. Yeah. Guitar player plays an eight-string, and uh, it's super, you know, a lot more... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, there's similarities, I guess, you know what I mean? Like if, if I'm creating music, I just got to be extreme and, you know, my voice sounds like my voice, but, um, it's different, uh, than origin, I would say, I, you know, but I like it. I like playing it. We've only played five shows, but they've been really successful so far. So, um, we're starting to work on newer stuff. Uh, once Adam gets back from the like, Zoom tour, so awesome. And then tell me about the the new new Origin album, Chaos Mos, which I think is definitely one of my favorite albums from last year. So, how was the writing and recording process for that? Being as it has been was like five five years between Unparalleled Universe to Chaos Mos. Yeah, well, I mean, we were we were on tour when COVID hit, 
and like 2020 was such an amazing year for me. I did the boat cruise for the second time, 70,000 tons of metal. And then we did South America for like three weeks. And when we were in like, I want to say Colombia is when I started, uh, they saw like Asia on my passport and they were asking us questions. This is February, 2020. And they're like, were you in China recently? I was like, oh, that was like years ago. And anyway, they were making people from China in Colombia, you know, Central South America, go into this separate area, you know what I mean? Um, uh, to make sure that the, they had to go through some kind of testing. I don't even know exactly, but we went, we went through normally. And then, uh, <laughs> you know, we ended up down in Brazil during Carnival and then we flew back. And we started another tour, and it was with um, uh, Beneath the Masker defeat and Defeated Sanity. And uh, and uh, we did, like, Kansas City, St. Louis, and then that St. Louis date, that was, like, everything was getting, you know, can't be more than 500 people can't be more than 500 people okay well there was like 300 people that show but chicago had like 300 and some pre-sales and but it's, they said by the time we left st louis and we're driving to chicago they're like no more events with more than 250 people and there was already over 300 pre-sales but then you know so the promoter was like well we're still doing the show uh, and so like i don't know probably 300 people showed up but then we played Detroit the next day and uh, beneath the massacre who are Canadian, they, they were like, we're crossing the border. We don't want to get stuck here in America. So they left after the Chicago show. And so the three of us went to Detroit and or the two of us went to Detroit and then, uh, Oh, defeated Sandy was on there too. Excuse me. Um, the three of us went over to Detroit Wait, played the show and so we were supposed to go into Canada so we we're going uh geography wise so here's Detroit we're going to go across the Peace Bridge in Canada and drive across Canada so anyway they denied us entry to go to Canada to play those shows so we had like a show like so John and Jason live up uh, John Jason lives in upstate New York and John lives in the city so we're like well that probably just no one knew how long this was going to last you know what i mean so we were like well we'll just go to jason's in upstate new york miss the four canadian shows and then we'll pick up in boston connecticut new york city and so it was about an 18 hour drive from detroit to albany the long way you know what i mean and uh and we have a trailer fan with a trailer you can't drive you know you can't go as fast you know what i mean so you know it was like well, uh, maybe not 18 hours, but 14 hours or something. I don't know. Anyway, got there. By the time I got there, uh, they are like, New York City's closing down. <laughs> Boston's closing down. You know, the whole world's closing down. So by the time we, so we're like, they're like, okay, the next nine shows are canceled. So the whole Mid-Atlantic was canceled, you know, and Florida wasn't canceled, but it was like, do we want to really drive down to Florida and then get caught? them getting canceled and then louisiana and texas didn't care but then like there was like other areas like colorado and arizona they were like no we're not doing you know what i mean it was like different states had different ideas about covid you know what i mean so so we just i just me and mike drove john got a car and rented and went to new york city and me and mike drove like 20 hour 22 hours from albany to just outside of Kansas City, Kansas. And that was like, and and that was like weird because I had a van with a trailer and you couldn't go into restaurants. You know what I mean? You can't really drive a van with a trailer through drive throughs You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it was like a 15, 15 seater with a dual axle six by 12 on the back. You know what I mean? So like <laughs> the only places we could go was like truck stops. You know what I mean? To get food, you know, food and gas. Would let you still go in but you had to wear a mask or whatever and the streets were desolate and then i got we got the kansas unloaded all the gear and like i there was a blizzard and i couldn't 
tight 70 to go. So I waited like four days and then I drove um, 38 hours or something to California. And, uh, so that's 2020 right there. So, you know, I'm sitting here and 2020, everyone was just, you know, twiddling their thumbs, playing tiddlywinks thing. Well, what, what the future is going to come, you know what I mean? And, uh, so uh, let's we'll see, 2021 came around and things were kind of yeah. opening up, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but uh, I was sitting it and I was like, I was like, well, I, I have some material, but I didn't have really much material, but it, I, I still played guitar almost every day during COVID, you know what I mean? Um, so I was, uh, so I sat there and I contacted the label and I was like, to have an album out by the summer of 2022, we'd have to be in the studio at the latest point, what? And they're like, oh, well, to make it not rush, if you could be in the studio sometime between January and February of 2022. I was like, okay, so this is January of 2021, or maybe it was around February. And I was like, okay, so I'm going to dedicate one month. Okay, so in March, I'm going to write a song, Okay. And the first song I started writing was the last song. And that's probably, <laughs> so, you know, March it came along. I probably had like, Chaos Most was probably like uh, four minutes at that point, pretty standard. But so then in April, I was like, okay, I'm going to start writing another song. So, you know, I would play Chaos Most up to, a, and I had played the song to, I can't remember which one was the song to yet, but, um, off the top of my head, but then uh, came uh, May and I started writing a third song. And so like, I would go back and reevaluate the second song. So, oh, actually the second song was Decolonizer. So Chaos Mose and Decolonizer, they weren't called that at that point, but it was like, those were the first two songs. And so like, so then I would start writing like, so I wrote uh, the third track as the third month. Um, and uh, so then I would go back and I'm like, oh man, I could add more on to the chaos and this would go with this, you know what I mean? So that's why those songs are probably longer and more dynamic because they had more time written with them. And then, the, you know, like uh, Coldscape was written in December and that was the last song written uh, besides the outro on Chaos Mose that was written in the studio. But, you know, so each month I was like, hey, so... I write a song in March, April, May, and then I have nine songs in December, and then we go in the studio and you know track it, and then we'll have, the album will be out in 2022. You know what I mean? So that was my game plan. I just sat there and you know it's like sometimes you know I felt like sometimes I was forcing stuff, and it'd be funny. And once I got to thinking like that, I basically was like, dang, I didn't force anything. It just came, you know. Like the day I was like, I'm not just I'm just gonna play my guitar, and that's, something happened, and that's. The album is kind of my ode to Origins' take on death metal. You can probably find Origins' take on Origin. You know, like the first song has some Cannibal Corpse influence. The second one, I just want it to be, you know, just kind of simpler and easy to digest, but also have some technicality that the kids like and the breakdowns. So that's more like the ode to the more... Uh, slammy and technical bands and the third song is um an ode to like the origin origin era you know it's got a very vomit you out feel and then uh, the fourth song panoptical that's another one of those things that was sitting around for a while and uh like the tappy beginning was kind of written uh, around the not when I originally started with Continuum, but when I started finishing Continuum, I was doing more double hand tapping stuff. Yeah. And I just had that sitting around at the beginning. And then I just created that wacky roller coaster ride. And then um, I had this, uh, so uh, Decolonizer um, was kind of an ode to like Napalm Death, like Harmony Corruption and Entomb clandestine um and it, it was kind of crazy like well i mean jesse pandato uh, uh who i got to meet and actually play through his guitar and when we opened up from once you know i was uh, i was like oh man nobody writes riffs like harmony corruption where they just have like this 
you know, the two step kind of coming thing out. And then like in tune clandestine had like some different beats and I tried to incorporate some of that sound into decolonizer. And then like, I like, it was weird because like I was listening to him a lot and then the LG passed away and I was like, so then I didn't put it in the booklet, but I wanted to put uh, the solo and that was a tribute to LG as a, as I can't know what, I know it's Lars something, but I was going to put lead guitar Petrov. <laughs> so, um, cause the first part of the solo is very in tomb sounding. And then I do this uh, kind of James Murphy kind of tribute. Cause I wanted to sound, 91 or 92 you know what i mean and yeah. uh and then i added like this kind of finger tapping thing that's you know to make it sound like origin in there too so um and then uh cold scape i wrote right around christmas it was kind of a joke i was like black metal christmas and then uh <laughs> i was just fucking around had a santa cap on one night was wasted playing guitar yeah <laughs> so yeah um and then uh let's see oh uh uh man uh, but you gotta think this is like your eighth full-length album with, with doing so many albums over the years does it feel like easier to make albums or do you feel like it's more difficult since you don't want to like repeat yourself more difficult you know like uh oblivion you know like the, that was my tribute to you know like two of my favorite bands that are no longer well it's got a Dick Dale guitar part at the end, but it's like Slayer. It's very Slayer and Bolthor, uh influenced. And then uh, we actually did a bonus track that came out later, a disease called Man. Um, that was on the Decibel Flexi Disc um, version. It's probably online somewhere too that you can download or stream. But uh, and then Chaos Most was that was trying to be like a different form of you know, the epic ending. Oh, shucks. Sorry. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. And my phone just said low battery. So I'm just like, so I, it just went blank for a second. I'm sorry. But anyway, in the chaos most, I was just trying to make an epic crescendo of an outro to an album. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and then the whole thing about, you know, uh, uh, you know, the uh, heat death is the title for the closing track. And like, there's different theories about how the end of the universe, but it was kind of like, you know, eventually the molecules speed up and then they just disappear. You know, that's the end of the universe. So I was trying to give that kind of like crescendo of climatic building on the song. And then I did a kind of a spooky outro kind of thing that I always, I always add stuff to the album after everyone's left. And so they did. They don't even know what they're going to get when they get the album. Because <laughs> I had solos and stuff that they never heard before. Uh, so that's one of the things that they're like, what the hell? What what did he do? What did he do to that? What did he do to our album? What did he do to it? You know, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. it's just certain things that I've thought about, you know, uh, that, you know, I just try to make it so they don't know every plot twist. So when they put on the album, it's new to them too. Like, Oh man, what do I, am I going to like this? I <laughs> so. yeah, I'd hope so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And sort of kind of like in the end to wrap things up, what's next for origin. Have you got any more tours uh, tours lined up? If you're allowed to announce, um, I don't have anything I can announce yet. We just, we are not with our former management company. And so we are, I'm working with booking agents and talking. We have a European agent, but we're working towards getting new management. Um, we are currently not on any record deal. Um, we're still able and anxious to tour. It's just some of the things that have been presented to us just in align with our schedules. Uh, the only thing I really can say is that we're playing Chicago Domination Fest coming up at the end of this month. Um, we're day two headliner. Mortician State 3 headliner. Um, so many brutal bands. Like, I mean, like, oh, I yeah, mean, I can't keep up anymore with all the bands. I mean, but there is some really heavy, heavy bands on this bill. I mean, like, you know, like, I would consider Origin, I mean, we are very aggressive and, and, and all that. But, you know, as far as, like, 
the super slammy, guttural, heavy, technical. I mean, I just consider us death metal at this point compared to some of the bands that are coming. I mean, I always have, but, you know, compared to some of the stuff that comes out to these days, you know, it's just so crazy, the sounds and music that people are playing. So I I, I guess they say I'm, I'm, I'm the pro person that started the problem, so I can't really complain about it. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can't go wrong there. So uh, before we go, Paul, just want to thank you for this conversation. It was great to be able to talk with you today. There's just any final words you want to say to the viewers that are watching this? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for the interview. And sorry, it took a little bit to get it going, but I'm very grateful for it. Thanks for all the supportive origin. Obviously, you have a uh, a very uh, you know have our all our albums and stuff and and been supporting the band for some time look for us to have something announced it's usually at origin band, origin band on facebook or instagram um you know something to be announced soon just nothing that i can say yet that's confirmed um the goal is you know we want to get out there we really haven't toured much for chaos Must. we still need to work on towards the future for something new but we only have played we played one european tour um uh with monstrosity in europe in january of this year that went really well and uh also i mean we were on tour like seven weeks and the album didn't come out except for the last two weeks of the tour so technically we only have played maybe 45 shows where we would do that and you know um you know a tour you know what i mean so we we still have some touring to do so hopefully by the start of next year is what we're looking at unless something big pressing comes up you know band have band will tour if in need you know what i mean so hopefully something pops up soon so origin band on facebook and instagram i don't think there's much else yeah you know, out there really good up-to-date information Awesome. So everybody, Paul Ryan from Origin, we'll see you next time.